right, ClubWWI.com members. I'm standing by with this week's guest on Radio Free Insanity, but of course you get to hear the interview first. Uh, I'm standing by with uh, a man who really needed no introduction if you've been following the world of professional wrestling. He, he's a manager uh, that you definitely know who he is. He's the one and only Giant Soul Bro, the doctor of style, the Reverend Slick. Slick, how are you? Welcome to the show this week. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we're so glad to have you on. I, I guess the first question uh, that everybody must be wondering, uh, tell us a little bit about what you've been up to and what's life like right now for, for Slick. Well, you know, I left uh, WWE back in 93. And so from then up to now, I've just been concentrating on my ministry. And uh, we've been doing everything we can to try to win souls for the Lord. And I help people that uh, whose souls have been ones of the Lord to help them to reform and conform to the ways of Christianity. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like uh, for a lot of people, once once they're done kind of uh, with a full-time schedule in wrestling, they, they don't really know what to do. But this is something that you've been doing actually back even when you were playing the role, not even a reverend slick, but even before that when you were the doctor of style, you, you've always been, uh, been a reverend. Is that right? That's right, yes. Uh-huh. What was that like for you? That's something I've always wondered. I mean, we're here in the 80s, the 1980s, and, you know, wrestling is on TV, and not everybody, I mean, some people kind of knew that it was uh, a work, uh, for lack of a better term, but at the time, you were playing this, this kind of jive-talking uh, slick on television, but at the same time, you're, you're in your, uh, you know, you're in front of your congregation, and you're preaching the word. Was it hard for a lot of people to kind of understand the difference between what you were doing on TV and, and who you were in real life? No, not at all, because, uh, you know, my ministry is in my hometown, mm-hmm. so people knew me, they, know, they knew me all my life, and uh, they pretty much understood I was playing a character, you know, my name is not Slick, <laughs> you know, I, I, I wasn't born, and, and uh, they put Slick on my birth certificate, you know, so they knew that that was a character, and uh, we pretty much uh, never even brought that up. Well, I might as well put it that right now. I call you Slick on the show because I know a lot of performers, when we have them on, we like to, you know, use our character names. Some people don't like their real name. Your real name is, uh, is Ken Johnson, uh, and you're currently a reverend. Uh, one of the things, too, about your career that, that I was always intrigued by is the fact that you're one of the, the few managers that I saw in WWF from the day you debuted uh, until when you left. A lot of guys, Jimmy Hart and Bobby Heenan, they were there already when I really got into it. But I still remember fondly the day that you, you went with Freddie Blassie to the bank, you took out all the money, you handed it to him, uh, and you took over the contracts of the Sheik, Volkoff, and Hercules, uh, kind of the end of, of Freddie's run in WWF and the beginning of yours. Uh, tell me a little bit about how that came about and, and how you were approached about taking over uh, Freddie's spot, I guess, in, uh, in WWF. Well, you know, when I came in, that was where they placed me. Uh-huh. And uh, I just assumed that role and uh, tried to do all I could to make that character fly and make it pop and, uh, as we say in the business, get over. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, I mean, one, one of the other things, too, with uh, that a lot of people might not uh, realize is that you're actually a second-generation uh, performer in the wrestling industry. Your father was, uh, was Rufus Jones, is that right? Exactly, yeah. What was that like for you kind of growing up in the business and, uh, and being exposed to it, uh, I guess, throughout most of your life? Well, you know, what can I say? <laughs> Just, uh, I guess the same as anyone else, you know, who's uh, in any other profession, you know. And, uh, you know, I forget second generation football player or basketball player, but the same. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. It, it's. <laughs> yeah, but, well, I mean, it's one of those things that it's, uh, I mean, so we've had a lot of people on. Ted DiBiase has been on, uh, and his dad, you know, was Mike DiBiase, and, and we had Nick Bockwinkle on. And so many of them remember just being young and, and, and their first exposure really to the business, either going to an arena or, or uh, messing around in the ring after their dad had finished wrestling. What was, uh, what was one of the earliest uh, exposures you had to the business or actually even getting to, to kind of go behind the curtain with, with your dad back when, when you were younger? Actually, I never did. Oh, no? Yeah, I never did. We didn't. Well, I didn't go around. Uh, I've kind of been well. That's a church person mm-hmm. all my life. I wasn't interested in it. Oh, uh, how did it come yeah. about then? That, that you became uh, that you became a manager? What was this your idea, or was it kind of? Uh, I mean, how did that come about then? 
Well, I need to go to work. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing to do, man. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, you were very yeah. successful with it. I mean, it was the kind of thing where, uh, you know, by the time you got to WWF, you actually came in uh, almost, it seemed like, you know, a perfect time for you uh, because within uh, about a year uh, or so of you being in the company, they came out with the Pile Driver album where Red would, would sing. And to this day, I remember my friend got the VHS of the, uh, the Pile Driver video before I did. And I asked him, I said, how was it? What, what was on it? And the first thing he said to me was, you have to see Slick's thing because he, he's, in, <laughs> he's in the chicken and he's in. They won't let me eat my yard bird. Uh, really just so much popularity from that, from that song. Tell me a little bit about being approached about, uh, about doing the song and, uh, and kind of the reaction to it. It really was one of the most popular songs on the album. Well, actually, I was somewhat apprehensive about doing it because I didn't think I had any talent in music. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I was a little excited, but uh, again, you know, apprehensive. I, I thought I'd fall flat on my face, really, <laughs> trying to, especially trying to rap, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, the, the gentleman that they had uh, hired to direct and produce and you know, they were very good, very uh, talented, and uh, they worked with us, and, uh, you know, I think it turned out pretty good. <laughs> No, it definitely did. Well, I mean, the video, too, I remember, uh, you know, walking down the street. You guys were in Connecticut, and, you, and you're walking down, and you have all the people out there just singing at you, and you're, you know, I'm on a jazz old so bro. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was actually... Uh, actually, a, a, a lot of the people that uh, was in the video was just that. They were citizens of the community. Oh, really? They just came and joined in, yeah. And so it was, it was working, and we just rolled with it, you know. Mm-hmm. No, that was me. I mean, it actually it fit your character so perfectly, and it, it was the kind of thing that... Uh, I think so many people, when they think of, of Slick back when, when they were watching wrestling, they remember the song as one of the first things that kind of pops into their mind. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, another thing, too, that, that you're kind of known for is that you managed uh, such a wide variety uh, of different performers. You managed, as we said before, Hercules, uh, Sheik, Volkov. Uh, you also had the one-man gang. And I think right. this is the, the most famous one is, is, is how you transformed him uh, from the one-man <laughs> gang over to Akeem, the African. You took him into an alley and, and you had people singing. And next thing you know, here is you know, George Gray, 400 pounds, dancing and, and jiving. Uh, how much influence did you have on that character as far as showing him how to, how to kind of handle himself as, as being the African dream? Well, actually, the, the entire concept was mine. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually... Yeah, can take credit for the uh, creation and formation of that character because uh, it just kind of came to me and I went to Vince about it and he liked it and so we went with it. How did, uh, how did George say when, when, when he heard that that was what he was going to be probably the excited the bounder? Well, you, you got to remember George and I are very close, very good friends. Okay. And uh, so we had discussed and I would never have gone to, to Vince and let, you know, George had been in agreement with it, and so he liked the idea, and, uh, you know, he was going to add knowledge, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I mean, uh, re it. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you know, reinvigorate, the, you know, our characters and, and uh, revitalize them, give them uh, a shot in the arm, so that's what we went with. Well, I mean, what, now, once he was, once he was playing the Akeem gimmick, uh, they, they teamed him up with uh, with Bossman after, after a little while, uh, making them kind of the twin towers, the two of them together. Uh, I mean, you had a great run uh, with Bossman. I think specifically, I remember um, that cage match that Hogan had against Bossman, and at the end, you came in and, and you slapped Hogan five, and then he then he attacked you. Uh, I mean, what was that like as far as? I mean, here you are, you're, you're in the '80s, and you're performing. I mean, wrestling had definitely changed by then, uh, and a lot of the matches that you managed people in against Hulk Hogan were, were huge matches because Hogan was the uh, was the biggest name uh, of the 80s. Did you know that you were going to be a part of something so big and, and you were going to have uh, as much success as you would as a manager? Well, i tell you what, I certainly aspired, aspired toward, you know, that end, and uh, it was uh, gratifying to see it come to fruition. Now, I... I, uh, I, yes, I anticipated that happen, uh, that happening because uh, I gave it everything I had. And, uh, I, I, I tried my best to excel in my craft, and, you know, what, what, what I did. And, uh, of Hogan, as you know, is phenomenal and uh, just uh, the hottest thing going uh, in that era. And so it was easy. Uh, and I was fortunate enough 
enough to have many of the top performers that, that uh, worked with him all over the country. Uh, and uh, we set a lot of records in attendance and, and gates, you know, uh, during that time. Yeah, Hogan, Hogan was amazing. I've asked uh, a lot of the guests who we've had on who, who have known Hulk and, and worked with Hulk, uh, and everyone always has positive things to kind of say about him behind the scenes. I mean, you hear a lot of negatives through rumors and things like that, but a lot of people who have come in contact with him uh, had nothing but praise for him. What's your opinion of, of Hulk and, and working with him uh, when you were in WWF? I think Hulk was a great guy, uh, and I mean that sincerely. Um, you know, he... He had a he had a heart for people, and uh, I have nothing but praise for him as a performer and as a gentleman, uh, performer in person, you might say. Um, and uh, you know there was that electricity that was in the air when you were working with Hogan, and uh, it was a what a rush just going to the ring. You know, you could just feel. Uh, the intensity in the air, you know what I'm saying? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, as, a, as a fan, you can even feel it, you know, just being in the arena, uh, watching right. it. I couldn't even imagine being at, at ringside for some of those matches and just the, uh, the crowd reaction and how it must have been for you just standing there and getting to be the bad guy, uh, against this ultimate good guy. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Hogan's an outstanding interview. Now, you weren't part of, of probably Hogan's biggest card. I mean, you weren't a part of his match, but you, you were, a, I mean, I guess in, in history, WWF's biggest show uh, they've ever done, which is WrestleMania, WrestleMania 3. WrestleMania 3, yeah. Absolutely. And one of the things, I think you, a lot of people, when they talk about WrestleMania 3, they talk about Steamboat Savage, they talk about Hogan Andre, but so many people still bring up the fact that, that you were stripped uh, during your match and then came back two matches later still with your clothes kind of hanging off of you because uh, of Tito Santana in, in, in your match with uh, when you managed Bush the Natural Reed uh, what was that like for you at WrestleMania 3 going out there in front of you know, 93,000 people and just standing there and uh, and just kind of taking it all in what was that like? Oh, fantastic you know the fabulous feeling uh, I'm sure you can imagine just to have been a part of something which at that time and maybe even today I, you know I don't know I'm checking but it's Set a record for an indoor uh, tennis mm -hmm. So, it, you know, to be a part of history is an incredible feeling. Yeah. Well, the match you actually came back out for was something that um, just again made headlines recently, not really headlines, but the Iron Sheik, uh, who you were managing at the time, they fought the Killer Bees. Uh, and the Sheik has been very vocal uh, about issues with B. Brian Blair. That he had had. Well, did you see any of that when you were there? Was it was there any problems uh, surrounding that match that, when you were a part of it? Well, no, I didn't. And uh, I've only recently heard of these um, these of this situation, brother. Uh, I've heard some of the guys talk about uh, uh, and the insiders in the business talk about that uh, friction, and I never knew that existed. I certainly didn't know. Yeah, that was on a personal level, like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, so things like that, things like that happen all the time. You know, uh, personally, I didn't really care for big balls, man. You know, so. Oh. Yeah. And that, that's that's so. Was that the whole time that you were with him? You guys kind of had that that uh, those issues, or was this something that developed after you started managing him? Oh, uh, something that developed, but man, but it wasn't deep. You know, mm -hmm. it was deep. I, I, never, I, I never had friction with him. You know, he just wasn't my kind of guy. Okay. Yeah, I never had, we never had a crossword, as a matter of fact. Uh, it could be one of those things. I know we've had, uh, we had Bobby Heenan on. He was talking about, uh, not necessarily heat, because I think a lot of wrestling fans tend to think that things are black and white. Either you love somebody or you hate them. Uh, and Bobby didn't really have heat, but he said that, that Rick Rude would complain sometimes to, uh, Mr. Perfect that he was afraid that Bobby would steal his heat, uh, as, as the, uh, manager. Was that a problem that you ever ran into with a performer saying, you know, uh, I, I, I did. I ran into that problem with Rick Martell. Oh, really? Yeah, really did. You know, I, I managed him for a brief uh, period, and uh, he complained that I was uh, was um, overshadowing a little bit. Um, and I probably was. Um, now that I think, think back on it, I probably needed to have done uh, his character looks different than I did everyone else's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, well, Rick was also at the time, I think, uh, 
he, he was his career baby face. So by, by turning, you know, heel at that point and, and becoming the model was so early in his gimmick that it was kind of hard to gauge exactly, you know, how much he could do and how much he couldn't do. Well, you know, when you when you have a guy who's been a uh, face for so long, and uh, then he turns heel when actually his his persona, his personality, his character just really is a heel material. Mm-hmm. It, it can create a problem, but uh, that was never anything personal between me and myself. It's just a uh, difference of philosophies. Mm-hmm. Did, did you ever run into that with, because um, one of the things I was always curious about, another guy, the uh, group that you managed kind of briefly, and then they, they didn't really branch out on their own, but kind of just did their own thing, was this power and glory. Uh, you, yeah. Can you manage them, too, for what seemed like a, a few weeks? Well, what was the deal with that? They, Hercules and Roma turned heel, they introduced you on an event center, and then that was kind of the, uh, it, it played it out after that. What, what was the story with that? Well, I think I think the deal with that was, uh, they was they were so glamorous, it was difficult to, back, again, like I was talking about with Rick Martel, mm-hmm. it was just difficult to keep them uh, as heels, you know, the people, Sometimes, you know, the fans will turn a baby heel and a heel baby. Mm-hmm. And so that's what happened with him. Yeah. The way it was tough, too, because, I mean, Paul Roma, if there's anybody who looks like a, like a baby face, the young stallion, I think, <laughs> was a hard, a hard act to sell. Yeah. So pretty. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I want to ask you, too, about one of the uh, one of the things that, that made your interview so unique, and I think it's a term that I still kind of use sometimes if I'm just, like, joking around with somebody, but, but you coined the term exacticatively. Uh, and you used to use it during your interviews to, to kind of uh, get under uh, your Sean Mooney or Mean Gene's uh, skin. When you were creating the character of Slick and looking at, uh, at kind of how you wanted to portray it, how did you come out uh, come up with a lot of your uh, your mannerisms? Was there any sort of uh, influence or any sort of inspiration that you got from uh, from anyone? Uh, no, not really. Uh, most of the things that I did, uh, I was what you might call a natural talent. Mm-hmm. In other words, uh, uh, and, and actually I really credit that from a gift from the Holy Spirit, the same thing that allows me to be able to preach in the manner uh, that uh, I do, and it's called uh, illumination. And uh, that's pretty much what happens to me. I don't hardly plan what I'm going to say or do before I do it. Mm-hmm. You just do it instinctively. Yeah. Or intuitively. Well, it's actually, I mean, the, the way it sounds, it sounds like uh, you were able to use a lot, of, a lot of your faith and a lot of, of your beliefs to kind of to help you out uh, within the industry and within your character. But one of the things, too, is, is a lot of performers, uh, they, they turn to God after their careers are over, but you were uh, a man of God when you were with WWF. But yet, when we talk to so many people, that you hear so many horror stories about backstage, and it was immoral, and it was this... With you being backstage at WWF, were there any ever any times where you said, you know, uh, uh, when you ever tried to influence somebody else to maybe kind of help them turn their life around? Did you ever get to the point where you just threw your hands up and said, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a man of God, and what's going on here is uh, is, is different than what, than what I'm used to? No, no, no. I used that as an opportunity to spread the word of God. Nice. <laughs> you know, there were guys that I led to Christ. Uh, you know, one man gang being one. Uh, uh, Mr. Fuji, uh, you know, and others, you know, but I led to Christ. So, you know, and then when, uh, and, and when I was there, they, they weren't doing the thing they do now with the women. Yeah. With the females, you know, we didn't have just very few females were there then. Yeah, it did. I, wasn't, I wasn't in that era of the, of the, uh, Godfather, uh, and, uh, quote-unquote, whole train and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's changed so much. I mean, the last, the last 10, 20 years, it, it's almost like a totally different animal now compared to what it was when you were there with a lot of the... Uh, I mean, when you were there, with, they had federettes who, you know, took your, your ring outfit and left, and now they're bikinis and things like that. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Do you, well, I, now you, you, don't watch, you don't watch the product currently, right? You don't watch WWE at all? No, I don't. No, I don't. <laughs> it's changed. I mean, it, it's gotten to the point where I think when, when you were there, uh, people who didn't like wrestling would say, well, it's silly and I don't watch it. But nowadays when people don't watch it, they say, well, it's raunchy and I don't watch it. And to me it kind of feels like 
it was easier to bring in new fans when you're like, well, it's just silly fun, come watch it, than what it is now because it has such a negative connotation to it. Um, I'd have to say what you're saying is true. Mm-hmm. And, uh, well, that's just about all I can say. Yes. That's what I'm hearing, too. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, man. Was there, was there any thought on your part? Uh, because one of the things about, about your career is I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you, that you spent, as far as between WCW and WWF, you were with WWF for most of your career. Was there ever any thought of going to WCW? Was there ever an offer made by them to, to kind of come over and, and manage on their show? No, uh, there was never a thought of me going, and there was never an offer from them for me to come. Wow. I was in NWA, you know, for a brief period of time. But, uh, no, I never, I guess I wasn't connected uh, with uh, WCW because uh, I did this, you know, we did a long thing with uh, a team and I, with uh, Dust, uh, Dusty Rhodes. No, no, I'm sorry, the big boss man and I with Dusty Rhodes and uh, Sapphire. And uh, so uh, I was custom him, and then when he was uh, uh, in charge at uh, WCW, I could never get an audience with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I never really tried either. I, I was, I, like I told you, when I was growing up, I wasn't interested in the business, even being a second generation. I just wasn't interested in it. And then once I left, uh, I wasn't interested. <laughs> it was kind of done. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you were lucky in the sense that you got to finish your run with, with WWF on a positive note. You got to play the role that I, I guess was mostly based on your real life. You got to play the role of Reverend Slick. Um, Tell me about how that came about, how somebody approached you. I, I, I'll tell you what happened. Vince mm-hmm. McMahon, Bobby Heenan, Yorilla Monsoon, Pat Patterson, Terry Garvin, uh, Howard Finkel, uh, Jim uh, Filipiano, uh, uh, you know, uh, did I say Gorilla Monsoon, Bobby Yeah, Heenan? yep. Yeah, okay, and, uh, you know, they all came to my church and, Fort Worth, Texas. That's where I was at the time. I'm in Longview, Texas now. Okay. And uh, they all came there, and uh, they heard me actually preach. And uh, I think Vince McMahon, you know, was was uh, inspired by that or affected by it. And uh, we got together and changed, and changed my character. That must be. I mean, that's the kind of thing that. Uh that you wanted to do for a while? Was it something that you had wanted to do for, for, for a while and we were just kind of happy when uh, when Vince McMahon decided that it might be something that would work? Actually, I was not. Oh, no. But no, what I wanted to do, I never wanted to play, I never wanted to play the character of uh, Reverend Six. What I wanted to do was keep the character I had slick but just turn it baby face. Okay. Mm-hmm. And just keep it kind of the, the, same, the same style gimmick but, uh, but at the same, same time. style gimmick but just baby face, yeah. Well, I mean, at the time, too, there was also, uh, well, not at the time, but a little bit before that, uh, Brother Love was doing his show, and it was kind of loosely based on uh, on Evangelist uh, and the way it kind of came about. And instead of saying God, he, he was preaching love. Uh, how did you feel about that gimmick? Did you, did you think that was a little too close to home? Uh, maybe, a, a, I would say, sacrilegious because it wasn't directly God. But was there anything about that that, uh, that you weren't happy with? You know, I, I'm the kind of guy that gives reality. Mm-hmm. See, the whole thing, the whole thing is entertaining. So, I just never ever crossed the lines with that. Yeah. Too many, a lot of people tend to, tend to forget that and take things a little too seriously. Yeah, right, exactly. I, you know, I never, I never crossed the line with it because what it was, as you say, they never brought up Christianity, they never brought up the Lord, they never did anything like that. Yeah. And, uh, they were, just mocking pretty much the image of something uh, of, of uh, television, televangelist. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely, uh, I mean, it's the kind of thing that it, it's funny because it changed so much, as we said before, in the last 10 years, because after that they had introduced, uh, they introduced Reverend Devon, who was playing the, the heel uh, Reverend, and then they had uh, Vince McMahon was involved in a storyline uh, just last year uh, with Shawn Michaels, where, where yeah, I don't think it was mocking God, but in a way kind of mocking God, too. So it, it's changed so much as society has changed. Uh, the business is kind of, there, there's no more line. There's no more, uh, there's no more lines across. I think that we've already crossed it. Yeah. Definitely. Believe me, if there's any, 
tell the lion left. I would. <laughs> I don't think I'd dare to venture upon it. That is a scary line, I think. <laughs> I would want to see it. Uh, uh, it's funny. One of the other things, too, with, with, with your career, we, a lot of the legends that we have on, we bring this up. Uh, back when you were in WWF, uh, they had this policy where when somebody would leave, it was like they dropped off the edge of the earth. You know, uh, Sergeant Slaughter was here one day, and then he, he vanished the next day, and we didn't hear from him until he came back. Nowadays, in 2006, there's, there's such a push for nostalgia, uh, and there's so many uh, DVDs, WWF 24-7, uh, legendary action figures, things like that. So it kind of seems like, uh, even with you, they, they had a manager's DVD come out last year, uh, where performers today uh, who, who wrestled in the 80s and 90s are, are still well-known within fans, um, and, it, and it's kind of changed a lot of things. How do you feel about that? Have you been approached by WWF about possibly doing a, some sort of Legends appearance or, or, uh, or some sort of Legends contract with them? You know what? I never have. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't be accurate if I, if I were to say it, it hadn't bothered me a little because I, I think I'm safe in, uh, in thinking that I had a certain degree of success mm -hmm. and bought about a certain percentage of the WWE's uh, prosperity. And uh, you have never been, you know, mentioned or even invited uh, uh, a contract again uh, to come back. And, you know, I've been gone now for 14 years. This, uh, wow. Uh, this, uh, well, it was, it was 13 years, I'm sorry, this past August. Okay. And, uh, never, never once been, uh, mentioned about it. Well, in 1998, I spoke with Vince McMahon, and he, he said he thought it was time for him to come back. But then that was quickly buried, and so, I never, uh, never heard from him again. So, I don't think I'd be accurate if I said that, uh, it, it, it hadn't bothered you some of the out there have ever. Yeah, you know, I talked with Kamala. Yeah. Uh, even yesterday, and, uh, and, uh, you know, he's been back a couple of times and all that kind of stuff. And I, I talked to George, uh, about three weeks ago, and he's been back, you know, and, but, uh, you know, that's the way it goes. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you think it could have to do with the fact that, that WWE is aware of, of how their product is, and maybe they think that it might be something you might not be interested in just because of your beliefs and, and how the product is today? No, I don't believe that at all. I believe it has to do with the color of my skin. Okay. But, I mean, I, did, I, did I open up a can of worms then? No, no, I'm actually, I'm actually wondering if you can elaborate on that, because that's something that, that's been brought up on and off from different people. So, I mean, did you ever face any any prejudice while you were there that, that you felt, uh, you know, was, was directed from the company? Uh, indirectly, never direct prejudice. I mean, I encountered it. I encountered it, the use of the N-word by a couple of fellows, uh, when they didn't know I was around. Okay. I never had anybody to just use the N word just in my face. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, you know, I heard it used, uh, and uh, I wouldn't care to mention names. But uh, yeah, I did hear that. But uh, I, you know, it, my whole character was uh, was a result of racism, and I, I don't think it was a uh, it was a uh, overt. Uh, uh, you know, I think it was. Uh, um, Indirect, as I said, because most of the people in WWE in their private lives at that time in management, I'm talking about, mm -hmm. didn't have direct access and uh, dialogue or interaction with African American people. So everything that they believed was something that was stereotypical, mm -hmm. and uh, and they they you know that's just about how it goes. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just so similar. We've had we've had Kamala on here. Uh about three times he's he's been on the show. We uh, I came out with a book last year that, that he was actually a part of, where he told us a story very similar to what to what you just said about um he was supposed to wrestle Hulk Hogan and, and then he overheard somebody using the N word uh, about him uh, from from around that corner. So it kind of seems like the story. What's that? True story. Oh yeah, I mean, but it's the kind of thing that, that always pops up in, in WWE. They're actually. Uh, they're trying to turn into storylines now. They have wrestlers going out there saying, you know, uh, there's a lot of racism, you know, and, and I'm not getting my title shots and, and things like that because of the color of my skin. Uh, I mean, is, is it the kind of thing that you felt, uh, 
Do you felt any heat? Any of the, any of the boys ever ever uh, ever ever show you any prejudice? Not just people in the office, but uh, but anybody just working around them? Because I mean, in wrestling, it's, you know. Certainly, you know, it's, you know, we, we need, you know, not gonna bite my tongue about that. Uh, there's several of them that are that way. Okay. You know, I mean, they'll show you respect. Uh, I mean, if you're the kind of guy that can demand it, uh, and if you're not, then hey, you no. Know, but uh, I, I would have to say, I would have to say, as I had said prior, uh, the, it, it's, I never just really saw guys just go out of their way to express uh, racial, pre- racial prejudice just openly, but in subtle ways you can see it all the time. Mm. All right, but I mean, but while you were there, you had, I mean, you had a great career, and it's the kind of thing where, uh, you know, even with some negatives here and there, you, you still made the most out of it. Looking back on your WWF run, uh, what would you say was, was your favorite moment, your favorite match that you were involved in, and, and your favorite time in the company? I think my favorite match, or combination of matches, can I say that? Sure. Was the ones with Hook, with the natural book read, one man game, and boss man. Okay. Especially the, the uh, cage match in the Metal End Arena, where I did the, the uh, cross body over the uh, steel cage. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, showing off a little athleticism. <laughs> well, that was, that was actually a question I've always wanted to ask you, and I'm so embarrassed because I don't remember the match, and I, I hope you could remember this. Cause I remember watching it. I think it was on primetime wrestling when it happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, you were involved. You, I think it was a six-man or a tag match, and one of the wrestlers in the ring, and it was either Hercules or Tito Santana, it was someone had, had roughed you up and knocked you off the apron. And you went crazy, and they had to hold you back as you tried to get into the ring to go after uh, the wrestler in the ring. Uh, and I remember thinking that it was such a, a weird thing because WWF always used to try to make the managers look kind of like punks, like they would always get beat up. But, but you really, I mean, you stood your ground, you went after the guy in the ring. How, how did that come about? And, and it seemed like such a, a thing that was out of place for the, for the business. Well, it was just a spot. Mm-hmm. It was a spot. Um, uh, as, I, as I said earlier, you know, I never plan what I'm going to do. And uh, I, I moved by instinct, and uh, it was uh, just one of those moments that uh, that was what my intuition told me to do, and uh, I responded that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was definitely, I mean, it was it was one of those moments that, that I've always remembered, too, from, from when you were there. But but now, uh, within your career, you're getting to do a lot of, uh, you know, going back out again, doing, uh, I know that you'd recently done some uh, some reunions, uh, you know, autograph signings and things like that. Mm-hmm. What's it like for you now to kind of get back together with these guys years later and, and, and reminisce with a lot of the guys you used to know? Well, you know, as in any business, relationships are formed. And... Uh, when that career comes to an end, sometimes the people that you form these relationships with, you don't see them for years. And so when you happen to be reunited with certain individuals that you've grown fond of, uh, then, you, you know, it's things where you, uh, you're related, you know, excited about it. And, and I, that's how it has been for me. You know, I just recently did a, uh, a, a deal out in California. Uh, a venue of out in California. Uh, and, uh, I got to see Jimmy Superfly Snooker and Brutus the Ball of Beef Cage and uh, Gang Grail and uh, Coco Beware. And, uh, and I hadn't seen these guys in 10, maybe 11 years. And, uh, so, you know, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, as I said, George Gray and I, one man gang, uh, are extremely close. And uh, I haven't seen him in five years. Oh, wow. I haven't seen uh, Kamala in five years, but we talk on the phone. As a matter of fact, I just talked to him yesterday. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> Kamala, yeah, Kamala's been great. He's, uh, I mean, talk about a guy who definitely, uh, I mean, he does the spots that he wants to do, and, and I've, he's one of the few people I know who's just genuinely just, just happy with everything that's going on, his music and things yeah. like that. By the way, uh, yeah. you know, I want to remember him in our prayers. He just lost the son. Oh, I'm sorry. I haven't spoken to him in about a week or two. I didn't know that. Yeah, about uh, a week ago, his son uh, passed away. So I remember him 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, oh, actually, I'm actually giving a call and I didn't even realize. Wow. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, all, all of our listeners out there, if you guys are listening, definitely. I mean, Kamala's always been a, a friend to us and one of the, uh, one of the guests that we've had on so many times that, uh, wow, that, that's, a, that's a terrible uh, to hear about. I'm sorry. Yeah. Now, with, with, with the business and, and kind of the, the time that you spent in it, because you, you've had a lot of time in the industry, uh, if you could look back, and we ask all of our guests this, on anybody that, that either came before you in the industry or came after, you know, you left WWF, anybody that you never had a chance to work with, that you always said, you know what, if Slick was ever with that guy, we would have uh, we would have made some money. Who, who would you pick, and, and who would you uh, have wanted to work with, and why? Well, there are several, but uh, one that stands to mind right away uh, would have been uh, King Kong Bowie, Bruiser Bowie. Okay. You familiar with him? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Bruiser Brody. As a matter of fact, uh, Bruiser Brody and I had uh, probably were going to New York uh, if I hadn't gone with um, the Natural Good Dream. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, yeah, I enjoyed, uh, and I think I would have enjoyed working with the Freebirds back in the and their heyday, you know, they had electricity also, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Once again, I think Michael Hayes is still even, I mean, he's there, and he's, he's been one of those agents that, uh, you know, he, he's, he's crazy. I <laughs> mean, he's, he's done so many things in the, in the business, but he's still there, and he's still uh, getting to do his, uh, his thing backstage. And then, yeah, a lot of these guys, they, they knew what they were doing back then. It translates uh, years later, even if uh, the business has changed uh, so much, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now, tell me a little bit, because when we first spoke on the phone, uh, you had said that you're again accepting bookings. Like, like the doctor's style is back, I guess, on uh, and, and sporadically, obviously not full-time or anything like that, but, but you're looking for, for bookings again out, out there, and people might get a chance to see you again out there in the uh, independent scene? Well, sure. And uh, uh, But I'm actually looking for opportunities to promote my ministry. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Christian groups uh, that uh, have crusades going and anything that's involved in winning lost souls for Christ, man. I'm, you know, I'm interested in that. Okay. As well as bookings. <laughs> <laughs> they all go to, but you know what? If you do it correctly, I think they all uh, they all work. They they can work together. Exactly. There you go, man. I wanted that on the show. Let me give everybody, because we have an email address. Uh, if anybody is interested in uh, in contacting uh, Ken Johnson Slick for, for any appearances, either to promote his ministry or to appear on uh, on your show, if you have a show, uh, if you're just somebody who wants to have him come out and, and hang out in, you know, in the backyard with you, don't, don't send an email. Uh, but if you are a promoter, if you are somebody, uh, you can contact info at icwwrestling.com. Dot com. Uh, it's info at icwrestling.com. Uh, and yeah, and, and, and Slick, I mean, it's the kind of thing where I think many people would, would turn out to see the, the return of, uh, of the doctor style, the reverend, or, or whatever you decide to, to do when you do return to the ring. Thank you. I appreciate that. And it's been a joy and a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, oh, and uh, because I say this humorously, uh, if someone does want me to come out and hang out with them in the backyard, as long as they're paying a booking fee, I'll be right there. <laughs> you better watch it, man. You're going to have a lot of backyard appearances. <laughs> People are paying, you know, hundreds of dollars on eBay for, uh, you know, phone calls. You better watch it, man. Hey, we'll do it. Let's go with it. Well, Sleek, before I let you go, I always give everybody the opportunity right at the end. Anything you have to say to all the fans out there who have supported you uh, from your WWF days to now, uh, anything you have to say to your fans? Yes, I would like to say to the fans, you know, there's a song that's uh, many years old now that says, there's no me without you. And one of the things I try to do during my career, I always try to be kind and polite to the fans, and I tried to sign autographs as much as I possibly could uh, away from the venues, and uh, I, I look forward to seeing the kids and uh, just really trying to encourage them and doing what I could to try to help people have a good life and uh, bring joy to people's lives. That's what it was all about, entertainment, and I want to tell the fans, thank you so much for your support, and thank you for helping to make the doctor style character slick. Uh, be what it was, and I certainly appreciate you. Wow. Slick, thank you again so much for being on the show, Ken. We, we, we had a great time having you on. 